Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Ann Campbell. I'm a member of the Friends of UW Madison Libraries, and I want to welcome you to our live stream event. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Friends. For over 70 years, the Friends organization has been supporting the libraries at UW Madison. We're an all volunteer organization that strives to bring visibility to campus libraries and to the world class collections they hold by awarding grant support to UW Madison libraries and to scholars who come from around the nation and the world to use the exceptional collections in our libraries. We also raise funds for the libraries through our semi-annual book sales, which sadly are postponed until next year. And finally, by hosting events such as this one, highlighting our library collections. This evening, Professor Joshua Calhoun, an Associate Professor of English here at UW-Madison, will be discussing his new book, The Nature of the Page, with American Players Theatre actor and Friends Board member, Sarah Day. Professor Calhoun specializes in Shakespeare, 16th and 17th century poetry, and in the history of media. As a faculty affiliate at the Nelson Institute for Envi Environmental Studies, he also teaches courses in the environmental humanities. In his teaching and research, he gets to explore three things he loves and thinks everyone else should love too. Shakespeare, old books, and nature. His work has appeared in Adirondack Life, Environmental Philosophy, Outside Magazine, PMLA, and Shakespeare Studies. And he adds to this list the publication of his first book, the Nature of the Page, Poetry, Papermaking, and Ecology in Renaissance England, published through UPenn Press. Sarah Day, who serves on the board of directors of the Friends, is a Wisconsin native and a UW-Madison graduate with a wealth of acting experience. In addition to acting on many stages in Wisconsin and being a member of Forward Theater's advisory company, Day has acted for well over three decades with the American Players Theater, or APT, the classical theater troupe located in Spring Green, Spring Green, Wisconsin. Her knowledge of all things Shakespearean will make her a delightful discussion partner for Professor Calhoun to discuss his Renaissance era book, The Nature of the Page. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome them both to our virtual stage. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's my pleasure to be in conversation with Professor Calhoun this afternoon. And I think the best way to start out learning about the nature of the page, um, Josh's wonderful book, is to have him read from the preface of it. Would you do us the honor, Professor Calhoun? I'd love to. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah Day and Katie Ann Campbell and to the friends for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to read from the preface, uh, which is uh, simply titled Beginnings, and it, it has an epilogue from As You Like It. Uh, Duke Senior says, it talks about having uh, tongues in trees, books in running brooks, and sermons in stone. So this book tells a story about paper in Renaissance England, about what it was elementally and what it was not, about what a page of paper did, what it was made to do and what it would not do, about what it made representable and unrepresentable, recordable and revisable, preservable and destructible. It is a story about recording so much of what we call history on sloshed together plant fibers. For most of the history of printing, paper was made primarily from recycled rags. So this is also a story about using tattered ship sails and worn out clothes to tell new stories about the past, about the plant fibers used to make those textiles that were eventually used to make texts, and about the plant fibers that frustrated papermakers' best attempts to replace scarce natural resources with abundant natural resources. The paper in the story this book tells is a marvelous but flawed protagonist the product of nature and culture, of non-human and human agency. This story about human ideas recorded on plants is also an environmental story about the ecology of paper and about the ecosystems in which poets and plants can become and unbecome Renaissance literature. And because plants like humans are defenseless against time's scythe, 
This is also a story about corruption, corruption and replication and the desperate hope that we can out replicate the thing we love so as to preserve it from decay. We have by and large taken for granted the ecologies that allow, disallow and alter the storage and transmission of ideas. We overlook not only the nature of handmade pages, but also the nature of the electronic screens on which we access digital reproductions of those pages and record our own ideas. Portions of this book, especially ideas that came at moments when keyboard and screen or pen and paper were not manageable, were first recorded on an iPhone, a now ubiquitous communication device that in its earliest versions was made with toxins such as arsenic, beryllium, lead, and mer mercury. In 2015, Apple Inc.'s new Take Back initiatives aimed at recycling finite resources recovered nearly 200,000 pounds of cobalt, more than 2,000 pounds of gold, more than 4.5 million pounds of aluminum from old iPhones. Though we may not have such precise statistics for natural resource usage in 16th and 17th century bookmaking, we know that like smartphones, Renaissance books were made from and with finite resources. They were also made with visible, recognizable traces of ecological matter, recycled clothes, slaughtered animals, felled trees. The nature of the page draws attention to the plant, animal, and mineral materials employed by human creatures who seem to have a unique need to externalize cognition and memory. Creatures whose minds are bursting with ideas that they want to transfer to some savable, shareable format. The study traces the plant fibers found in handmade papers through the late 1800s when recycled rags were replaced by living trees as the stuff that stories like this book are made of. My focus is especially on the ways in which production and use of handmade paper have influenced and been influenced by global resource availability in the age of burgeoning exploration and colonization and natural resource extraction. Eating, we know, has human advantages and ecological consequences. Agriculture has profoundly altered our planet. Writing and reading, too, have human advantages and ecological consequences, and on a scale that we have not yet honestly acknowledged in our stories about book history or fully recognized in our studies of environmental history. Acknowledging and engaging with the ecology of media in other periods and places, this book focuses on a particular medium, paper, in a particular time and place, Renaissance England. But the questions I ask of early handmade paper might be just as productively asked of millennia old Eastern palm leaf books, or medieval scrolls, or Victorian headstones, or junk mail, or the newest iPhone. They might be distilled into three questions that guide this work. One, how has the scarcity of non-human matter altered human communication? Two, how have humans creatively imagined or reimagined the textual possibilities available to them in a given ecosystem? And three, how has human communication been altered by the corruptibility of the non-human matter used to make texts? Scarcity, possibility, corruptibility. These three eco-poetic negotiations, as pertinent to 21st century ebooks as to 16th century books on handmade paper, guide the nature of the page's narrative. Paper mills required rivers, and I think it is appropriate that the two, river, the two rivers have shaped my own understanding of the nature of the page. I grew up near the source of the Hudson River in the patchwork wilderness of the Adirondack Park, a six million acre area larger than Yellowstone, Everglades, Glacier, and Grand Canyon National Parks combined of which roughly half is private land, villages, businesses, farms, et cetera, and the other half is forest preserved that's been designated forever wild. With age and reading and train trips down the Hudson River to access rare books in archival libraries came the realization that the Adirond Adirondacks were not a sovereign island of wilderness, but were, and in many ways continued to be, New York City's hinterland. My journeys through the watersheds and river valleys between the Adirondacks and archival libraries have shaped this work and have left me unable to think about technology and progress without also asking about wilderness and landscape. Now in Madison, Wisconsin, I write these words less than 50 miles from where Aldo Leopold once stood on the edge of the Wisconsin River looking at a piece of driftwood and jotting down observations that would, with enough paper and time, become these lines in a Sand County almanac. He writes, the spring flood brings us more than high adventure. It brings likewise an unpredictable miscellany of floatable objects pilfered from upriver farms. Each old board has its own individual history, always unknown, but always to some degree guessable from the kind of wood, its dimensions, its nails, screws or paint, its finish or lack of it, its wear and decay. 
One can even guess from the abrasion of its edges and ends on sandbars how many how many floods have carried it in years past. Here Leopold offers what we might now recognize as a material culture reading of lumber that's invested not only in political and cultural systems, but also and especially in ecosystems. Drawing attention to what he calls the biotic interactions between people and land, Leopold claims that the riparian lumber is quote, not only a collection of personalities, but an anthology of human strivings in upriver farms and forests. The person who understands human strivings in upriver farms and forests has a kind of ecological literacy uh, that might be, uh, sorry, ecological literacy to reconstruct the history of a piece of driftwood, Leopold claims. The driftwood serves in Leopold's account as a kind of literature that might be taught on campuses, according to Leopold, a record of the past that is accessible and available to be, quote, read at will. The language Leopold uses to describe the ecological readings is that of eager curiosity tempered by sensible humility. The history of a board, Leopold claims, is always unknown, but always to some degree guessable from the kind of wood, its dimensions, its nails, screws, paint, finish, lack of decay, lack of lack of it wear or decay. This language of discovery, of the unknown, but to some degree guessable, of drawing on imperfect expertise in an attempt to make the ecologies of media more legible, aptly describes the project that this book undertakes. I quote these lines from a specially issued uh, it, Leopold Pines edition of a Sand County Almanac, an edition that in two, uh, 2007 was, quote, printed on paper made from pines planted by Aldo Leopold and his family in the 1930s and 40s. In a forward to the edition, Nina Leopold Bradley, A. Carl Leopold, and Estella B. Leopold, who as children helped to plant the very pines from which the volume's paper was made, write of the happy continuity of their father's, quote, precious pine trees becoming the medium the paper on which we print his moving words, unquote. Reading Leopold, reading Driftwood, on pages made from the pine trees he planted with his children is for me quite a lot like holding Renaissance books printed or written on handmade paper, objects hu whose human ecology repeatedly interrupts the text on the page and insists on being read. The Leopold Pines edition is one of many examples I cite in this book where the nature of the medium paper intertwines with the message it carries in complex ways that are mostly unknown, but that are at least partially guessable. The nature of the page then tells a story about textual habits grounded in and supplied by ecological habitats. It's a story about plants, animals, and minerals on which the poetry of Shakespeare and his contemporaries was stored and then transmitted across time and space. And it's a story in the end about the ecological resources we use now in our attempts to preserve the poetry we have received from the past on thin, pliable, handcrafted leaves of organic matter. Thanks, Josh, that was great. I really, I'm so intrigued by the things that are a part of your journey to be writing uh, writing this, this beautiful book. Um, part of the thing that I do want to start with is how Katie, when she introduced you, sort of said that the three things that matter about the book, and I think are things that matter about you, are the three things that you like, which are Shakespeare, old books, and nature. And um, as someone who has worked from the folio doing Shakespeare in the out of doors, I feel a bit, little bit of a kinship to those things that have to do as well as being um, in a place that is within a mile of the Wisconsin River. Yeah. So just down, just down the road from that second river that, um, that shaped uh, where you're coming from. I would like to uh, begin, if you don't mind, even though you've just read this lovely preface to your work, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about you and you talking about um, how the Adirondacks and where, your, um, where you come from uh, sort of shapes uh, your story. Yeah. And um, if you talk a little bit about what that nature preserved, how close you were to it, how many of the 46 you have uh, you have tromped among or upon or above or on. <laughs> I would love to hear uh, you talk a little bit about um, about your life there. 
Yeah. Thank, thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a real honor to, to chat with you um, about this. And uh, yeah, there's such a, a shared love of so many things. Um, I, so I grew up in the Adirondacks, so that, that area, that, that very large area that fits many parks combined inside is uh, it's often referred to as the blue line. And when, when I say I'm from New York, uh, folks from Wisconsin think New York city. And I say, no, the Adirondacks. And they say, where's that? And I say, well, you've heard of Lake Placid, have you? A miracle on ice? Oh, yeah, we, we had a guy in that. We had a couple, two, three guys in that. Yeah. Uh, so you know, when people know, people around here who know Lake Placid because the miracle on ice, the 1980 hockey game, that's up about where I was from, inside this blue line up closer to Montreal than, than New York City. And so um, Eric Hyden. What's that? Was that the year that Eric Hyden, I believe, won five gold medals? I believe it is. I. That's one of those. You know, it's it's interesting. Sometimes the history of your own place is a good question. I believe that you are right. Uh, because he sat I was very next, young. Yeah. Because he sat next to me in um in history class. Is the only really. Thing. So Lake Placid is very close to my heart because of uh, Eric Hyden, who is from Madison. Well, I can't believe I've come on here to talk about a book and you've, you're going to have me doing research here. I'm gonna... <laughs> Sorry, please. Please talk about it, Home. I apologize. No, this is great. Well, I, so I, I mean, Lake Placid is, it's, it's a, uh, it's an amazing uh, sort of that, that whole area up in the mountains. They're considered 46 high peaks. And one of the other things that uh, I, I, I got to do while finishing this book um, is I, I was, I climbed, I've got my sticker here. I've climbed the, the 46 high peaks with my daughter, uh, Misty Arden Calhoun climbed these with me and uh, she beat me on the last peak by a moment. And, 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 and so she's, she's got her sticker ahead of me, but uh, we, we were able to do those together. It was really wonderful. I um, re one, one way it shaped me is I find that walking, hiking is, is a way that I think. And so quite often uh, when I'm stuck on an idea, I will leave my office in Helen C. White when, when, you know, when we're in offices um, and go out to the Lakeshore Preserve, which is a third of our campus space and, and, and walk that um, and, uh, and think, and it usually un, un, unsticks ideas in my mind. Um, but I think the way that it affected the, you know, the way, way I think about it, right. Um, it's such a small town, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, it's, it's not a, a certain, certain certainly in a wealthy area of the world, summer, summer tourism, you know, comes in, worked a lot of, a lot of jobs there and, and uh, got to do some land surveying and, and uh, you know, so all, all, any sort of job you could, you could pick up. So I, one thing that I, I, I got to do, oh yeah, go ahead, jump in. Land surveying. Land That's surveying. Yeah. I was a rod man. I, I worked with a, a independent land surveyor uh, named Martin Thompson, who um I, I, I did not writing an article about him in Adirondack life, but uh, yeah, I talked a little bit about that, but it was, uh, we used to talk about sitting in the woods and uh, philosophy, doing philosophy with a capital F over lunch. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a good job, but you know, you just kind of do what you can and, and, and figure it out. But what it meant is that uh, uh, what I love about it is it's, it's, it's given me a desire, at least, uh, you know, writing an academic book is you, you always think of your audience, but I always just really enjoyed being able to talk about whatever I'm thinking about with, whoever's there. And so sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes in, 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 in one setting, people, oh, well, you teach, you teach Shakespeare that you, I should listen to you. I, not necessarily, but other people, you say, I teach Shakespeare. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this as an actor, right? You just, you'd want to find, but I really do want to talk to them and, and pick their brain and, 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 and think with them. And so parts of this book, I really wanted to, um, connect with, the small area I was from and all the people who supported the acknowledgements acknowledge so many people, a Shakespeare and community reading group that we did, we read together in Adirondacks and um, so, so some reading groups, but also just this realization that when I get on the train and I leave all the trees and I take that train down along Lake Champlain and then down along the Hudson River and I pull in through the, you know, see, you know, kind of move from, from trees into the, um, the graffiti on the, on the walls as I come to Penn Station, it was always one of my favorite moment. And then go to, say, the Morgan Library with its, 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 its mahogany and you look around and you say, you start to think, did the trees for this library make the same trip I did down the Hudson River? Oh, what a beautiful way to start. That, that just seems like such an incredible way to focus. Um, that, it, that it goes from written word on walls to written word on the with the graffiti going. I never thought of that, but this is why it's fun to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think how much of it, I'm getting a little bit of a, an echo. Are you hearing an echo at all? Oh, now I don't. 
Um, the, the idea of surveying and these other other jobs and talking to other people that are not part of an academic world or a part of uh, necessarily conservation, which is the old term um, for environmental or one that, that Governor Nelson, Senator Nelson would have used conservation back in the day, um, is such a fascinating look also at, I love that you would choose a job that was wasn't the first president of the United States a surveyor? Um, have I remember that in a cherry tree. Yeah, that's those right. are, yeah. So paper, again, those yeah. cherry trees being chopped down. But somehow the idea that even there you're choosing a profession that has sort of historic roots. Um, and that's, I think that that's incredibly interesting to be, to be looking at yeah. like that. Yeah, all these, I mean, it's, it's sort of this, the kind of, uh, you know, um, think of tennis. I'm I'm a part of all that I have met. Right, <laughs> sort of the, all these things become a part of me. Oh, that's lovely. Um, could you tell me a little bit about a particular uh, bookstore that played uh, a role in your young life? Oh yeah, I mean, I well, you know, um, that we all end up having these favorites, right? And and um, my my mother took me to the library. Uh, often, very, very often uh, as, as a kid, um, we spent a lot of time there. And um, I, I just, you know, that, that, that was, that's really where I get this love of books. But the love of used books, I think, really happened in, uh, in Lake Placid. Again, uh, there's a bookshop, there was a bookshop called With Pipe and Book. Um, and with like, pipe and book, and it's based on an old poem. With pipe and book, at the end of the day, uh, oh, I, I, it's it's a sort of a purpley poem about you know the, the the wonders of a pipe and book at the end of the day. But um, you know, and I I was I was uh, uh, young, and I was not. I this is not to uh, encourage smoking or anything like that. But there was this literary ideal of like having a pipe and a, you know, um, and uh, and and I would get old books there. And one of the cool things about that is, and this is not, I do not write about this in, the, in, in my book, but I do, this is this set the groundwork for what became, is there was a book that I got. So when, when with pipe and book closed down and uh, there were, they were selling off their books and, and I got my first old book, like, like not like, used book, you know, from, you know, 10 years back or something. Um, but my first old book, and it was from 1828. And it was a commonplace book. Uh, and, it, and the reason they had it there was it had a little section on Lake George, New York. Um, oh. uh, which uh, very, very side point, but I recently came across a letter from Thomas Jefferson to his wife, that he wrote on birch bark from Lake George, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but um, at any rate, this is about Lake George, and it wasn't talking about Birch Bark or Thomas Jefferson, but it was, uh, I, I bought the book, and I, I think, you know, in my mind, it must have cost $500. I think, I, I believe it cost about $15, but it seemed like a lot at the time, and, and you know, it was my first old book, and did I... You, did you, like, save your money, or... With the, with the intention and put it on layaway? Or? I don't think so. I was in college. I'd come back from college, and I, and I sort of saw that it was closing, and I think that $15 was something that I could, I could handle, um, but it was, it seemed extravagant because it wasn't like a book I needed to, you know, it just seemed, I remember thinking it seemed extravagant and that was with the sales. Anyway, we have started cutting it up with the, um, the Curry lab, the department of bacteriology. We have um, been cutting out passages from this commonplace book and plating them on Petri dishes and um, reviving uh, dormant microbes on the page. Uh, to kind of understand uh, what still lives on the pages of old books. And that's, you know, that, that all comes out of the later parts of my book where I started to think about how do we preserve these books now and what's still on them and how do they live and what do they do? And um, what is, what is a, you know, if, if all of this, if it's a plant that becomes paper, you know, the, if you think about what a plant wants or what, I don't know, you know, if you sort of think about how, where things go, things tend to have a process, a cycle. Our books, we tend to think of as once they become a book, that's the end of the line. They've become the perfect form they're supposed to become, and then they stop. But of course, they don't. They want to biodeteriorate. And, uh, you know, so we we uh, want to see what happens with uh, if we give essentially give them the food and water and see if anything comes to life on them. Oh, my gosh. Was... Um... I was raised with a very um, revered at, uh, feeling about a book, and um, did just, you write notes in your books? Did you? Well, it's it's funny because um, my dad, who really uh, he had collected a few older books, 
Um, and he would never dream of writing in a book. He would sometimes put a little bit of pencil in it and then it, be very careful that it was very light because there was something sacred about those books. Yeah. Whereas my mother would be somebody who, and she was a history person. My dad uh, was trained as a lawyer and um, they had very different attitudes. My mother saw it as a working thing. You look at that script, you know, you look at that book and you make notes and you say what you think about something. Yeah. And so like looking at her books, I feel like I, I love that I see her her thought process, whereas with my dad, I see his reverence somehow for this text. But what I wanted to ask, I guess, had to do with, was that, was it the cutting up of that book? Did that feel like the right thing to do? Because this book is meant to then be deteriorating and now we can find out its life. Well, um, I have two answers. Yes, it, I, I, li I liked the idea. Look, it costs. I, mean, I talk about this in the last chapter of my book. It, it costs a, a lot of, of um, not just money, but energy, fossil fuels to preserve books, and um, as a result, you know, you have to think about the cost of saving each book. Is everything meant to be saved and kept? And so, uh, this seemed to be giving a book a, a, another kind of um, uh, life, um, right? And 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 what we did is we, I mean, these these poor dormant microbes they wanted to live too and they just wanted some food and water right and so we gave them food and water and we let them we let them go yeah yeah it, it, it i think um but the other the, the other part of that is that uh ultimately it was uh the um person i was working with um caitlin carlson who who, who took the scalpel to book and so i i also a bit like when we you know eat meat i uh, quite often you know, we're, we're separated from that process and i, I was in that sense yeah you weren't destroying it yourself. No, but I, I was. I was party to it. Yeah. Okay, but you were wanting to be able to have it have a new life form, which I think. Yeah. I think that was one of the most enchanting things that I learned from, um, from reading your book had to do with the fact that it's this life journey, um, of every, you know, that a, what a king may go through the guts of a beggar and that kind yeah. of thing. That, yeah. Yeah have a process of past, present, and future. And that in some ways, keeping it just as a book is an artificial way of, I, I, did you sort of describe it as being in an induced coma? Um, yeah, it is, it is. Uh, yeah, would you? Ideally, right? I mean, that's the ideal is that we um, stop it from living or dying, right? But for a book that those things, those are kind of the same thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, and how to offer life. Yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued by that. Um, so we know a little bit. Um, during, uh, did you have any, uh, were your career ambitions always to be a Shakespeare professor? What were your, other than surveying and things like that, what were other professional thoughts you might have? No, I, I uh, well, I was never quite sure. My my degree, my undergraduate degree, um, is a pre-seminary degree. I thought it would go to seminary, and um, ultimately, uh, my uh, reading of I mean, the, the close reading skills I learned uh, served me well for the, the profession I now have. Um, it also raised a lot of questions for me, and 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 this is uh you, you know this is about the kind of personal journey you go on, but it raised a lot of questions about how do you get uh, the transmission of a of of, of a you know, a, a sacred text forward centuries without it changing, um, and and that that sent me into a lot of uh, a lot of questions for myself. So I ultimately ended up uh, then going to graduate school. Um, uh, well, I worked I worked as a journalist for just a little bit, and then I went to, then I went, I went to graduate school uh, at the University of Delaware. Um, and it really was there that 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 um, also my my work with the idea of thinking about paper making, I was able to do some, some workshops that encouraged that. And, and so I think that it, it, it kind of came together, but I, did I want to be a Shakespeare to answer your question? Um, some part of me probably, but I wasn't like, I mean, I went through phases of different writers and, mm -hmm. and I never really, even in high school went through like, I'm going to read everything by Shakespeare. Whereas I did that for like F. Scott Fitzgerald and, you know, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley and Edgar Allan Poe and you know, people like that. You know, I don't know why, but certain people just kind of fa fasten upon, usually because of what you found in a used bookstore. 
Oh, oh, interesting. I love that. You did you ever have any sort of oh I don't know basketball dreams or who? <laughs> uh, I, I well I wanted to be in the NBA. Yeah, I I um I'm. I grew nine inches in ninth grade and I thought I was a point guard. So I thought I had a chance, you know, I'm six, two now. And, and, um, you know, I, I thought I'd have a chance and, and, uh, I, I just, it didn't work out. We, the closest I got was, um, we played, uh, uh, a team that on which, uh, Lamar Odom, um, who now is better known for the Kardashians played. And it didn't, oh. it, I, in my mind, I was talking to Mike Leckard about this. In my mind, I thought this would be Hoosiers, right. But it was not Hoosiers. It was, it was bad. Oh, yeah. But nine inches in a year. Yeah, my knees hurt a lot. That's what I was. Yeah. Did, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine those. I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, it took me nine years to grow an inch and a lot of times <laughs> ever so much shorter than that. Oh, hello, Katie. Do you have a question? I do, yes. Uh, hello, I've got two questions um, that are actually um, very nicely related. I've got a question from Maria Safiati Dale Maria. Um, that asks um, whether you're using hyperspectral imaging, imaging, and a question from Patrick Rosenberg, uh, who asks. Um, this is a question for both speakers. Um, which is best, the smell, feel, or look of an old book? So perhaps we can start off with the first question on imaging, which is perhaps more related to look, and then we can hear what you both have to say. Yeah, thanks, Maria. I I am not using uh, hyperspectral imaging uh, like some are. So so what's there's a kind of um, shift in the field in some ways uh, towards uh, what is quite often called biocodicology. There are a couple of really interesting articles. One in the New Yorker um, in thanks around the Thanksgiving issue a couple of years ago, um, and I will try to find a link for that and, and end up putting it in the YouTube uh, channel here. Um, but uh, we. Think with bi biocodicology is just looking at everything else you can read on a page. So it's the same idea of legibility, much like with uh, uh, what Leopold is doing. Like, oh, if you look at this lumber, what else can you learn? Um, I love this question of legibility. And this may go back to something that, Sarah, you were asking me earlier. It's just, you know, thinking about um, literacy, leg legibility, intelligence. Everyone is intelligent in some way. They're just not all intelligent in the same way, right? And so... Um, finding ways to have conversations and, and draw other people's intelligence. And so the, what, what other things are legible on a page that I can't read? Um, and so I started here in this book, you know, what sort of plants, plant matter can I find? But at this point where hyperspectral imaging is allowing us to go deeper, to look at stains. And, and I know here at the University of, of Wisconsin, Heather Waka has been doing really cool work on this uh, stain project. Um, and uh, maybe somebody can put a link. I know we've got some of our holding history crew in, in YouTube. Maybe somebody could drop a link in, in, into YouTube. Um, also, uh, Leah Pope, who, who recently graduated from the English department and was working on that project and, and a number of other colleagues. Um, but I'm not the one to ask about hyper, hyperspectral imaging. Heather Walker would probably be the, the way to go. Mm. Uh, to Patrick's question, mm. uh, it was uh, smell, feel, or look, I believe. Um, Whew. Well, I just fielded one, Sarah. What do you think? I I got to say it at different times is different things. Sometimes the look of it will just grab me. And other times it's the, that, that, that texture. And other times it's the smell. I, I hear you. All of them are. If, if I will, I mean, there's a smell to a used bookstore. I think that's smell, but with a book itself, I think there's, um, what I love is is that texture of of old books, and unfortunately, my my book doesn't have that texture. It's 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 made in a sort of homogenous paper, paper that feels the same. Um, but uh, I know that Sarah Day has behind her uh, a collection of, of of books of of Shakespeare from the 1790s, and uh, I have here some book uh, a book from 1800s as part of our holding history teaching collection. This book is the first uh, paper made on, on from recycled straw. Uh, dedicated to King George the Third. For those of you who now think of George the Third as a funny man in a Hamilton uh, uh, play, and you'll be back. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but if we got close enough, we could see there's. It just got there's this texture to it, and uh, and to me, uh, Patrick, that that when I can feel the text like that, that's that's probably that that does it for me. Thank you for the questions. I, yeah. it's, it's nice to know there are people interacting on YouTube. This is new to me. I, I'm. 
Yeah, and my, my 1794, 16 volume edition of Malone's Shakespeare. Um, uh, it smells like there might have been a fire in Dublin at some point. Ooh. And also it's just the feel of that paper is absolutely, it has a musicality to it that I don't think of, of, um, of sort of regular, regular paper, whatever that might be. But um, all the things, I got all the feels, I guess. That's what. <laughs> I have next to me here, I love you said musicality. I have some paper that was made um, in coordination with um, a really amazing paper maker, uh, Robert Posale, mm. uh, um, amazing artist uh, doing a, a very cool project um, on the Black Hawk paper trail, paper made from um, unique varieties of um, uh, native and non-native and invasive plants along um, what is sort of like, if we think of uh, Black Hawk, the Sock and Fox uh, retreat uh, trail as like a, a, another kind of trail of tears. Um, oh. So Robert has worked with uh, the Holding History program that I, I work with, and, and we've made some paper together. Um, and so I, I have some here. So I, I also, this this musicality, I mean, we can you can kind of hear, especially this one, you can just, you know, it's just, it's got that, and these were made by students on, you know, we just have these, these molds and decals that we do them together. So I love that sound. So, so, um, uh, Patrick, I don't believe sound was an option, but, but possibly sound also. I love that. I like that a lot. Um, uh, I, I have a question that is um, one of the teasers that you have as far as promoting today's at to afternoon. How a Renaissance chicken saved Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tell me about that. It's an indirect narrative, but so um, the the connection here is uh, that, uh, and this I talk about in in the last chapter of my book, um, which is it's it's a the last chapter is titled after a done poem. Uh, it's, it's titled "This Book as Long Lived as the Elements." And in in uh, this chapter, I talk about uh, Francis Bacon, who was um, well known. I mean, he was a scientist and philosopher uh, who kind of sort of straddled. He was born right around the same time as Shakespeare, and and um, he's in 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 the sixteen. 20, or well, in 1620, he writes uh, the, the New Organon, which is he's trying to think of a scientific method um, in contrast to uh, now that we have these new scientific um, um, instrumenta instruments and instrumentation, um, and he's, he's putting pressure on Aristotle, and he's thinking, um, and he's thinking about, he says that there's this one, something that's really interesting um, that he points out is that, look, um, heat, the, the ability to to make artificial heat or essentially to, to make fire, humans can make fire change the world, change change what we can do. I mean, you, you go from like being able to have warmth to being able to have a, a home with warmth inside it to being able to, um, you know, have a fire to to um, do metal work. And so how much did heat, the ability to make and control heat change the world for humans? Hmm. And then he says, uh, but he, sa he says that, that humans are, and he, this is the way it's usually translated is, um, that, it, that lame in one foot or sometimes it's translated as lopsided, that this is lopsided because cold. Sometimes we have cold and we can do a lot with cold, but we can't make cold in 1600s, right? We can't make cold. And if humans could figure out how to make cold, we, we would, like that would change the world all over again. And in trying to pursue some experimentation on what he calls induration uh, or how to think of cold, he, he um, it snows in London, he's in Highgate and he's, he snows and and he gets excited and he stops um, uh, and, and, he, and he, um, he gets a chicken and he stuffs a chicken with snow, right? Just testing like, oh, can we like, what will cold do to a body? Will it slow the rate of decay? You think about the, well, of course, right? We keep a chicken in a fridge, right? But but you'd have to think about a time when they're figuring all this out, and and as a result, he um he catches cold and he dies, uh, but um there is a through line, and it's 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 very it's indirect, but there's this like right the same kind of experimentation of what could we do if we had cold? In 1902, um, Willis Carrier invents the what we think of the first HVAC systems, and it's installed in a printing shop in Brooklyn in 1902. Uh, the first air conditioning system was used to allow them to print. Um, they wanted to be able to print two colors. So do one run. And in the summer in Brooklyn, it was too humid. It wasn't drying. So this they're conditioning the air so that it will be less humid and cooler. And then they can more quickly run that second 
uh, printing run through and get the second color on there. So um, what we see now, right, is that, that if you go into a library, uh, I, I, um, there is a, a website called, or there's a, a Google Drive that's shared among um, some colleagues that was started by um, a, a, a wonderful colleague, uh, Megan Cook, who uh, called, uh, how cold is that library? And basically it's a spreadsheet. So that if you're gonna go to an archive, you can figure out, do you need like, do you need like the full on like hat? Do you need earmuffs? Do you need a, um, a coat? And you will see people in fingerless gloves. I mean, they look more like they're, I think I say in the book, more like they're dressed for a snowball fight than archival research because we keep it so cold now trying to preserve the books. We talk about this being ideal climate, but it really does have an effect on uh, how we preserve the books, but also it's using a lot of fossil fuels. But I see Katie Ann's popped in here. So we must have a question from, from the audience. We do, we've got two questions. Um... We've got a question from Rich LaFleur about um, the Torah, um, but I'd like to come back to that in a moment because Christy Tidwell just asked a question that's really closely related to what you're talking about now um, with, with frost and keeping things cold. Um, so Christy's question is, thinking about finding life in the pages of old books, I'm wondering what kinds of life survive there. Anything potentially dangerous like viruses emerging from melting the permafrost? Um, and then we'll um, come back to um, Rich LaFer's question right after that. Yeah, um, Christy, thanks for joining us. It's uh, it's good to be here with you virtually. Um, and uh, I love that question. Uh, yeah, I think even this pandemic has certainly changed the, the way we think about like, well, what, I mean, Maybe we don't want things living in our books. Um, also, the, the, this question on what we can find in books, um, it's, it's a question of uh, we don't always know. So um, what I've been looking for in books and think about book microbiomes, that's part of the work I've been doing is looking especially at um, uh, fungi and what sort of fungi, different strains, you know, varieties of fungi grow in, in books. Um, uh, partly because I just love all the puns I can make, um, but also because, you know, it's, it's just it's, it's intriguing to me. And what's also intriguing is that they're, they're just all, all, all these um, species of fungi that have not yet been identified. So we, we know they're there, but they're just like we haven't yet identified. So we don't exactly know. Um, one of the other intriguing parts, like what else is in the book and what might we reactivate, um, is that uh, an important part of the paper making process is, uh, is you're taking your using recycled clothing so which is you know of course starts as plants it becomes clothing and then it's uh then it becomes you know when it's really worn out maybe use the rags and once it's really worn out then again you would recycle it um so uh and this was one of the challenges uh, parenthetically of, of you know the idea of can you cut out the the middle person so to speak that can you cut out the wearing of clothes and just go directly from a plant to paper and make a viable paper um which ultimately we do with trees so, um, but and anyway, the, the, um, if we're thinking about uh, uh, sort of what's, what's in paper, the, the, when the clothes are, are left to rot, or to, the process is called redding, but rotting, um, they're actually just sort of decomposing and it's bre breaking down all the stuff that, that, that um, uh, should kind of fall away and then using the cellulose for paper. And, and uh, Tim Barrett, uh, who's done some amazing work on paper, um, as well as this is something I've been thinking a lot about a lot with Robert Posale, thinking about uh, almost like sourdough starters, the different, uh, w how do you make paper of the same quality as that they were making hundreds of years ago? It's very hard to do. And did they have um, certain kinds of starters, so to speak, that really decompose the rags effectively or more effectively. Um, just like maybe you can't make sourdough as good as the sourdough, Mad Madison sourdough company. You know, like there's, they have something special and quite often it has to do with that early process. So what we don't know is like what could be reactivated. Uh, I don't mean to make it sound like it's a Jurassic Park situation, but I, I do think that there are, um, but there's excitement and the limitations, you know, the, the, or the, the, the concerns about being careful about what, we, what we're what we reactivating from, from books. Uh, I hope that answers your question. But as with any of these answers, I, I would be happy to, to discuss, you know, in more detail. Um, Katie, was there a question from, a question from uh, Rich Lethler? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Uh, would you comment on the Torah as a holy document? Does it form as a scroll on parchment add to the sense of sacredness that it commands? 
And would you would it have the same authority if it were a book? Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, well, the, the would have the same authority. I, I mean, I, I suppose it really matters what culture you're coming from, right? Um, we these um, different book objects or text objects. Uh, Amaranth Borsak has a terrific book called The Book, and she, she calls scroll or book a book, right? These book objects, they're, um, they are uh, really sort of things we grow up with. Think, oh, well, this is how you do a book. But of course, other cultures do books differently, do text, record their ideas differently. So I think some, you know, some of the reverence or some of the, 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 the um, sacredness of it has to do also with tradition um, and a, a, a cultural tradition, I guess I would say. Um, it certainly changes as a book. And that's probably more what I could speak to, Rich, is um, that when we go from scrolls to what we call the codex form or what you think of just as, as a book like my book that you open up or like we see in the background behind us, um, it changes things a lot. What it allows us to do is dip in anywhere. Scroll, you um, kind of move continuously from top to bottom. And, and, and we think if we scroll on a, on a website, you have to go past all of this stuff up here to get down to the bottom. In a book, you don't have to do that. You just, you don't have to look at it all. You just skip over to it. And so what it changes, and one of these great things, we have a, a Bible in special collections here in the, in the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and I sometimes like to ask my students, you know, they see, you see a Packers game and somebody's sitting there in the stands with John 316, you know, say, so can you find John 316? And they can't because it, it doesn't exist. Uh, they can find John 3C because this is a Bible that exists. I think of it as like a one of those tadpoles that still has the tail before it's a frog. Uh, I think it's called a froglet. Um, that it still exists in this intermediary form. They've not yet divided it into verses, but they have gone from a scroll where you go top to bottom, you don't need chapters and verses, to, okay, now we can move around in this and we have chapters and verses. Uh, and I, I still am waiting for the day I, I, I turn on a Packers game and I see somebody in the audience holding up John 3C, and I'm just going to, it's going to make my day. I look forward to being in the stands at Lambo sometime and doing that for you, I guess. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, speaking of uh, John 316, um, my understanding is that one of the things that, I mean, you said that the seminary was of interest to you, but mm -hmm. what I'm also interested in is that, that the language of uh, the King James Bible, which was, um, which unlike the folio was produced during Shakespeare's lifetime, um, is part of your feeling of familiarity, perhaps with, um, uh, with, uh, with the sort of, with Renaissance English. And I'm wondering if um, talking about that affinity, I would love to have you let me know what your first verse from the Bible was that you memorized. Ooh. And what was the first few lines of Shakespeare that you memorized? Oh, Sarah, I don't have the a memory of an actor. I, 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 I don't remember. I just simply don't remember. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, you know, we could talk about it. I mean, maybe as a, as, as a, I did promise to talk about a big mistake. And I mean, I could talk about the un unlearning yeah. of verse I knew which is a verse, that, so it's a verse I had to unlearn um, in order to understand what was going even on. Better, even it's, better. Yeah, some, it was Psalm 51, nine. So um, um, David says in the version I learned at some point in my life, uh, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. It's the most famous verse in the Bible. Psalm 51 is the most famous, uh, now John 3.16 maybe now, but in, in this period when you're, um, uh, Listen to the the you read you sort of the the way the reading schedule was set up for the Bible um, and the requirement to go to church. You heard the Psalms over and over and over, and of all the Psalms, um, you heard Psalm fifty one the most. Um, and so this this Psalm, you know, I knew it. I said, "Oh, it blot out all my iniquities." Um, I began to grow interested in, in in the language of blotting because what happens is this this word blot like where does it come from uh, and it's really not clear its etymology isn't really clear but what we what I discovered is that you know really uh, the word enters the English language alongside paper and and what you see if you go back and you look at earlier Bibles that you don't have um, 
a blot. You, you don't have, you, you have uh, high, something like hide your face and, and, and wash out all my iniquities. That's very different. Wash out my iniquities, scrape out, raise out, erase, right? My, 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 my iniquities. And so I was, I was fascinated by this um, because I was also thinking about uh, um, Henry the fourth part two and, 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 or even just all of those Henry plays where they talk about, you know, you know your, your sin, you'll be a blot, but my sin, I'm going to erase. Um, uh, uh, Hal says, I will, uh, when he becomes the king, I will raise out rotten opinion with that, which hath writ me down after my seeming. Uh, if it's my mistake, I'll erase it. And we'll just write right over that. If it's your mistake, Sarah Day, we're going to put a big old blot on that, as everyone can see. Mm -hmm. um, these are very different ways of, of changing a text. And so what I found is that uh, really uh, it's the King James Bible that, where the word blot uh, goes viral, so to speak. It just goes from appearing a few times from appearing no times in the Bible to going from being a wash out on my name to blot out. Um, and what we begin to see is, is, I mean, I, I think, I mean, this is the, this is my stretch and I won't, uh, I won't die on this hill, but I, I will, I will say, I think that there's a through line uh, if we think about, um, you know, doctrines of sin and salvation that, you know, you go forward to the scarlet letter, right? And you have, oh, God will forgive you your sin, but you have to wear this mark. Um, that's, that wasn't in the Bible before, like when Shakespeare started reading the Bible, the idea that you, you made a mistake and that would always be on your back. Everyone could see it. That wasn't there. Uh, it was washout. Yeah. So I, I found that really fascinating. And, and, and it was fascinating to also see how different characters in Shakespeare deploy this difference between I will erase my sense. You can't see it, but I'll blot your sense. Oh, that's a beautiful. Yeah. Discovery of a word. My word. Um, would you, speaking of blotting, could you talk a little bit about censorship and Shakespeare? Yeah, I mean, this is a quick one because I, I don't. I will see if I can show a picture. I did. I did flag it just in case I could show it. This is a in 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 one of the copies. I was just referring to uh, Henry the Fourth, Part Two, um, the Folgers Shakespeare Library, uh, where I did a lot of this research. I'm very grateful for the many uh, uh, folks there who is, who have helped and, and uh, assisted in, with this research. Um, they have a, a copy of, of Henry the Fourth, uh, Part Two. It's it's a, from 1600, and what happened is it, it, before it was in the folio, which is the big collection of Shakespeare's plays in 1623, and it, it, some of these things got cleaned up. But but prior to that, there, some, some swear words got in. So I'm going to see if I can show the screen. We'll just see um, what what we have here. You can sort of see. Uh, it says I E S U I E S U. I mean, your eye is automatically drawn to the place. Your eye should not be drawn. What's happened here? Someone tried to blot out uh, where where um, you know the, the character Shallow says Yesu Yesu. Um, you know, he, he says uh, the, the days we have seen. Uh, this is actually where uh, Orson Welles gets his his, uh, his title from the Chimes at Midnight. We've seen the Chimes at Midnight. Uh, so um, Yesu Yesu. Well, you shouldn't use. Jesus' name in vain, so they blotted it out. Yeah. Over time, that ink uh, faded, and it's and actually in the uh, Folger catalog, the way I found it, this is like it said that uh, Jesus' name was highlighted throughout, <laughs> which is what a blot does, right? It, it, the moment you see a blotted picture, well, I wonder what's there. That's the interesting stuff. Oh, that's so. It yeah. <laughs> And but it, it has to do with the paper's absorbency, right? It's just, it's that on parchment, and here's here's where this that comes to paper, the difference between paper, maybe I could say um, for a moment, but on parchment, you have skin, you know, you sort of skin your 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 knee or something, but it's not all the way down to bleeding. You know, you got that, you know, so you have these layers that you can really just take, and you can take a knife and, and, and you can scrape out a mistake and maybe condition a little bit and then write over it. Um, you can still find the mistake if you search really closely, but they're, they're, we're still finding... Um, uh, erasures and corrections in in manuscripts that, that were overlooked, you know, in the past. Um, mm -hmm. With paper, it's very hard. Now it is done sometimes, but it's, it usually, if you try to scrape, you end up with a hole. So you're going to get a blot or a hole, or you can cross it out. Um, but you, it's really hard to erase ink from paper because it integrates with the fibers of the paper. How long did it take any of those trying to make an erasure or trying to cancel something? How long did it take? do you think for that uh, blotting to then become a highlight? Do you have any sense of what? Well, 
That was sixteen hundred. I, I I don't know. That's a good question. I'm. It has a lot to do with also. I mean, they're making. This is partly why they're thinking about the when I talk about the Renaissance writers thinking about the ecology of their their text. They're they're quite often making their own ink. So it, you know, it's not as though it's a standard ink. You know, it, it could be that certain inks fade and change in different ways. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there, there's also that the, we, we get the same sorts of things. You know how you you, you say, um, oh, you know, I'm sorry I didn't text you back. I, I um, my phone was on vibe, right? Um, which is a way of saying like I was doing something. You know, it's, it's sort of this like you know, and, but like uh, Philip Sidney Rice talks about. Um, uh, his, you know, his pen is like his blotting truant pen. He talk, people talk about that, like, oh, my, my, my pen is just blotting everywhere. No, they're just using, they're, they're writing too quickly. It's bad handwriting, but they're going to blame the instruments. Um, and, and just, just like we do now. Of course. Uh, Speaking of instruments, I would like you to do something that is also part of your, um, of how you've been um, telling us about everything is, I would like you to compare old paper to an iPhone. Okay, uh, thank goodness. I thought you were gonna ask me to sing or do an instrument. Are you so right? <laughs> um, you know, so part of it is what I, I said in the preface, which is just that um, when we think about paper, so it's it's uh, sometimes you hear the phrase "rags make paper," and it's 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 not true. It's not exactly a lie, but um, that was the big. You know, oh, it's not trees. Rags make paper in the past. Well, it's sort of like um, uh, you could say beef makes a burger. Um, a cow was there somewhere, right? Something sacri something was sacrificed. So rags make paper, yes, but but it's plants that make the rags that make the paper. So we get plants involved in this. And so where how far back can we trace these things? Um, as part of my, I'm affiliated with Nelson Inst Institute for Environmental Studies. And I like think a lot about these. You know, what, how far back can we go? What else is part of the story? Um, why did we use these materials and not those materials? Why did we... Um, continue to, to, to use the same materials to, to the point of, of um, scarcity instead of being more innovative. Um, and so uh, the same thing is happening with our technology, right? And, and I mean, I, I could, you know, right, so this is the iPad. Um, when you're, when you look and you see it says, it says uh, arsenic free, it does kind of raise like, well, when yeah. was it not arsenic free? And the answer is a few years ago. And um the way these are being handled, right? We have, uh, we can also think about those who are handling the, the rare earth minerals, their availability, where they're coming from. So when we think about books like Shakespeare on paper, we are thinking about plants and, and also some animals. Um, when we think about Shakespeare on our iPhone, uh, we're thinking about rare earth minerals and um, some some uh, really scandalous practices that we, we should be thinking about and, and accounting for. And also the energy, the fossil fuel energy that's used to, to allow us to, to be on the grid and, and, and look things up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as fun as it. Yeah. I mean, as, as with anything, right. It, it's, it's part of a systemic issue. It's, it's, it's not just, I mean, we can't stop doing one thing and save the earth, but we can be more conscious of it. And, maybe to make it a ha not a happier thought, but I mean, it's a poetic thought, right? Poetry is quite often about loss. It's about understanding uh, things are fleeting and things are changing. Um, mm. So even if we can't control it, we can be aware of it and it gives more complexity to know the story behind. Just like for this Leopold book to know that, you know, this paper, right? It's still the same, it's the same, you know, although Leopold, you know and love, you. You know, I, I have that copy too, but to know um, this was printed on paper made from the pine trees he planted with his children, well, there's a poetry to that. And so even if you're, um, I mean, sure, it may make you think a little bit about your, your iPhone, but it may also make you be aware of, um, you know, the costs and the contributions from other lives and in, 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 uh, in the media that we consume. Well, thanks, Josh, for bringing us right back to Wisconsin and the Wisconsin River and the legacy of Aldo Leopold. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, thank you, Josh, for, for a wonderful talk and for a, for a beautiful book. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of the Friends of the Library. And please go to our website, which is library.wisc.edu slash friends. Thanks so much for joining us. We look forward to our next adventure with you. <laughs> Thank you. Good night.